Gaius Marius was elected as one of the ten tribunes of the plebs for the term following the death of Gaius Gracchus and the dismantling of all his laws save the grain dole. The tension between the wealthy senators and those fighting for the rights of the common people set the tone for most legal debates. However, with the death of the Gracchi so fresh in the public mind, the next tribunes of the plebs did their best to neither provoke nor offend the Senate with radical or controversial legislation. Though he himself was an immensely wealthy man, Gaius Marius was not born a patrician Roman and so did not belong to the exclusive club of wealthy senators who could trace their roots back to Rome's origins. Those patrician senators sought, through most legislation, to protect Rome's ancient traditions, as these traditions were so tied up with their own financial interests. Marius was born into a well-to-do and well-connected noble family from the Latin province of Arpinum, modern-day Arpino. His hometown had only been granted full Roman citizenship with the right to vote a mere three decades before Marius's birth. Despite his wealth and status as local gentry, Marius, because he was merely a provincial Latin, was what the Roman elites referred to as homo novus, or new man. The term new man was used in the same derogatory way that old families with generational wealth used the term new money to describe those who had accidentally tripped upon their fortunes. Unfortunately, his title of new man would keep Marius on the outside of Rome's political elite for most of his early career. The political ladder of Roman government, known as the Cursus Honorum, Course of Honor, or Race of Offices, was weighted in favor of already distinguished families. This meant that new men like Marius had a distinct disadvantage when running for public office against candidates whose famously named fathers and grandfathers had already paved the way. Every step up the Cursus Honorum for Gaius Marius was hard fought. He did not win every election for which he stood, and even when he did win, it was often by the skin of his teeth. Even his year as tribune of the plebs saw him elected to the tenth and final seat of that office. During his term as tribune, Marius alienated the wealthy elite even further by legislating for a narrowing of the voting bridges. Rome had only voted by ballot for the previous decade or so. Prior to that, voting was vocal and public. This process made it very easy for candidates to use their supporters to intimidate voters into changing their minds. Ballot voting, however, did not prove to be exempt from intimidation either, as the supporters of major candidates filled the bridges leading to the ballot boxes. There, they would snatch ballots from the voters' hands, inspect them, and then threaten them into changing their votes. Though this legislation was by no means controversial, Marius's narrowing of the bridges to eliminate room for crowds to gather won him the initial support of the Roman people, a scenario which always raised eyebrows from those within the Senate just waiting to accuse another populist of attempting to crown himself king of Rome. The following year, Marius barely squeaked in his praetor and was assigned the province of Hispania Ulterior to govern following his term. Praetor was the last step up the cursus honorum before consul, and consul was the goal of every senator with both the financial resources and the political curriculum vitae necessary to campaign for the office. Consul was the most sought after post because to be consul of Rome was to be Rome's commander in chief. The consul was a king, a president, and even a prime minister all rolled into one office. He sat unquestioningly atop Rome's hierarchy and, even after his term ended, controlled the Senate along with the other ex-consuls, whose debates were heard ahead of the rest of the Senates. The consul directed a number of areas of governance. First was his legislative agenda. Since consular elections were held a full six months in advance of the legislative session, the consular candidate ran on promises to his constituents which he needed to keep if elected. The consul had the authority to both convene the Senate and to set its agenda. He had the ability to propose laws and to open debates. The consuls also had authority to convene public assemblies for stamping into law bills agreed on and passed by the Senate. Two consuls were elected every year, alternating monthly in the position. While one consul was in charge, the other stepped into the background for that month. Though each consul held the power of veto over the other, to use it meant one's own proposals might be vetoed during his alternate's month in power. The consul in power was referred to as holding the fasces. Fasces were the ceremonial rods and acts carried by the Roman honor guard, known as lictors. Lictors were assigned to holders of various public offices, and the consuls, as the highest offices, were assigned twelve lictors each. 
This was second only to the office of dictator, with 24 assigned lectors. The consuls oversaw the elections of everything from low-level commissioners to next year's consuls. If there were protests, bribery, intimidation, or even political deal-making, these things did not escape their notice. This gave each consul a considerable advantage in ensuring his own supporters were elected the following year. Many private arrangements were made in which a consul promised to put his weight behind a candidate for next year in exchange for said candidate's vote on his current legislative platform. Consuls were also responsible for the reading of omens and assigning of public holidays. They were given the authority to set dates for public festivals and holidays not assigned a specific date each year. If the Senate voted in favor of honoring a certain individual, it was the consul who chose the date from among those deemed appropriate by the Pontifex Maximus. The final and most important responsibility of the Roman consul was as commander of Rome's military. It was the Senate who made a declaration of war, and it was the Senate who assigned an army to the consuls. But once the army was assigned, the consul was the supreme commander in his theater of war. As with holding the fasces each month, the consuls alternated control of the army from day to day. This system did not serve the army well because, if the consuls disagreed on the appropriate military action, new orders could be given each day which contradicted the alternate consuls' orders from the day before. Eventually the tradition changed, so that one consul commanded an army while the other remained in Rome to oversee government. In cases of extreme emergency, however, both consuls would take the field, each commanding his own armies. Within the city limits of Rome, consuls also played a pseudo-military role. When they were not with their armies, they were still responsible for the safety of the Republic. As had happened during the tribunate of Gaius Gracchus, the Senate had the power to grant the consuls a senatus consultum ultimum. Unchecked martial law became the consul's weapon during such times. To be elected consul was one of the highest honors to a Roman citizen. Every consul knew he would be celebrated by as yet unborn generations. Even one's birthday was referenced by the consuls rather than the day, month, and year. Julius Caesar would have said he was born two days before the Ides of Quintiles, the previous name of the month of July, in the year of the consuls Marius and Flaccus, instead of July 13, 100 BC. Often, young Romans could easily win lower-level elections by simply saying, My father was consul. And this type of name recognition is what kept the career of Gaius Marius stalled for five years following his election as praetor. His position as a homo novus, with no consular standing in his family, was a constant stumbling block to his political ambitions. Then Gaius Marius married a Julia of the Caesares. The house of the Julius Caesars was an impoverished family having nothing of great value but one of Rome's most illustrious names. The Julii Caesares had not held high office in almost two hundred years, and even then they'd reached only as high as Praetor. The Caesars' dwindling land holdings over previous generations left the Julius Caesars able to meet only the bare minimum financial requirements for membership within the Senate, and nothing more. The consulship was out of the question for a family with limited funds and two sons to install in the Senate. For Gaius Marius, marriage into such an illustrious patrician house, though no longer wealthy, added magnificent luster to his own name sufficient to launch him into the upper stratosphere of Rome's elite. For the Caesars, marrying a daughter to a new man, though socially a step down, would inject enough wealth into the family to fund high office for both of Julia's brothers, one of whom would father Julius Caesar. Because of his marriage to Julia, as well as other circumstances, Marius did manage to finally get himself elected consul. As consul, Marius immediately employed a current tribune of the plebs by the name of Titus Manlius Mancinus. Mancinus's job was to bypass the Senate and use the plebeian assembly to strip a patrician general named Quintus Metellus of his command against Numidius King Jugurtha. Jugurtha had led a revolt against Rome, which Metellus had fought for over two years. The plebeian assembly stripped Metellus of his command and reassigned it to Gaius Marius. Outraged by this legislative sleight of hand, Metellus left the province of Numidia as commanded, but refused to leave his army for Marius to use. This forced Gaius Marius into conscripting a new army for his campaign. Once again, using Mancinus, Marius bypassed the Senate and presented the plebeian assembly with legislation that would remove all property qualifications necessary for military enlistment. 
In this way, Marius could avail himself of Rome's sixth class, known as the head count because, owning nothing, they were merely heads the state was now responsible to feed according to Gaius Gracchus's grain dole. These laws infuriated the Senate who debated the precedent of using men who would fight not for the fatherland, but for gold and profit. The Senate's conservative element feared that such laws would ultimately create professional armies that would follow only generals they believed could make them rich. The division over Gaius Marius's legislation ripped the Senate into two camps, the populares, populists who supported Marius's radical changes, and the optimates, conservatives who ruthlessly opposed him, even if Marius's proposals actually benefited Rome. In order to show solidarity with the conservative patrician Quintus Metellus, his senatorial supporters gathered all their families and clients, and Quintus Metellus was greeted by streets filled with cheering crowds when he arrived in Rome. Because he had met the appropriate tally of enemy deaths, captured lands and treasure, the Senate granted Quintus Metellus a triumph, though the war in Numidia was far from over. Then, as a further snub to Marius, just in case he should somehow defeat Jugurtha, the Senate awarded Quintus Metellus the honorific title of Numidicus, Conqueror of Numidia. Though Gaius Marius's term as consul would last only for the 107 BC year, his command of the legions in Numidia would be prolonged until the end of the war, approximately four years later.